The lectures we're going to be dealing with in this series of five all have to do with the Renaissance. And uh, Marilyn and I lived in Florence, Italy on two different occasions, and I taught a specialized course in the uh, Renaissance in Florence. And unfortunately, I, when I was originally planning the series of lectures, I was going to do Renaissance and Baroque. And when I started to work through Renaissance, I just saw so many images that I thought were important that I just couldn't eliminate. And so normally I try to keep these lectures down to 10 or 11 images. Just about all of these lectures are around 13 images, which is way too many, but uh, I, I just can't help it. It's just amazing stuff we're going to be uh, looking at. What we're actually doing now in this series of lectures is we're, we're starting at the 1400s in Europe. You may not think of that as the modern world, but in fact, almost all art history textbooks divide the book at that point, and they call it the modern world. The reason it's called the modern world is you start to have the possibility of secularism. The church totally dominated medieval life. You look at the scale of the cathedrals, the hundred years plus that it took to make them, and you realize the church was everything in that world. But towns start to develop, commerce starts to develop, trades start to develop, and all of a sudden you've got the possibility of things outside of the purview of the church. And I'm going to start this series of lectures off with an image that is not northern realism. It's actually northern. It's Venetian, and Venice is in the north of Italy. But I hope this will give you an idea of what we're in for for the next several weeks. Can we see that first image, Jenna? This is a, a, a painting by Giovanni Bellini. He's, as you can see in the description there, he's a Venetian artist. And of course, it's called St. Francis in Ecstasy. Let's start with the idea of St. Francis being an important figure in the Renaissance. Remember, St. Francis, along with Dominic, who established the Dominicans, are what we call mendicant monks. In other words, they live in poverty. And they live in poverty to identify with people in need. They support people in need. It's early attempts by the Catholic tradition to reform itself, well before the Reformation. Now, they do that because in the medieval era, if you were poor, it didn't matter. If you were starving, it didn't matter. After all, you're going to have this glorious heavenly home. But all of a sudden, they started to pay attention to this world and people's life in this world as a preparation for that future world. And this particular painting, by Bellini, I think helps you understand what the Renaissance is all about. First of all, it's St. Francis. And you see, he's in ecstasy. We're not in a church, but in nature. There's a fundamental shift in a theological perspective. Remember the cathedral is a kind of vision of the heavenly vision of the kingdom of God. It's an attempt to bring 
heaven down to earth. And, and of course, the buildings get taller and taller and taller, trying to transcend the earth. All of a sudden, in this era, we start to say, God is here because God is, God created this world and God can be met in this world. So St. Francis has his ecstasy, not in the cathedral, but in a beautiful northern Italy countryside. And that's the shift that's going to permeate all of these lectures. This world matters, but it's not kind of anti-church, it's not anti-faith, it is what we sometimes call Christian humanism. We get the term humanism from classical culture, the importance of the individual human being. But it's, it's, it's permeated by the Christian faith. And so almost all of the image I'm going to be showing you uh, during the next few weeks are church-related images. They deal with the faith but they all have this theological perspective. Now, as I say, the, the theme of this series of lectures is the Renaissance, but in fact, we're starting with Northern work and we're going to finish the last lecture with Northern work, the fifth lecture. And I'm not calling them the Renaissance simply because it's a misnomer to call them the Renaissance. Renaissance means rebirth or renewal. Well, it applies to Italy because Italy was surrounded by classical culture. And the Italians were re the ones who renewed that classical culture. The Northern Europeans that we're looking at today on their own came to be concerned with this world and the way this world looked. So they developed a heightened sense of realism. In fact, most people give the credit for all this Renaissance realism to the Italians. It's not true. The Northern artists really were the first to start this. Last time, those of you who were with me when we finished off with the uh, French cathedral at Chartres, I showed you a statue of Saint Theodore. And I identified it as an example of Northern realism. It's a sculpture that's very believable, very realistic, freestanding almost. That tradition started in the late Gothic era and it's going to persist now throughout the, uh, the, the North. Can we see the first image, uh, Jana? This is a page from a book of ours. A, a book of ours is a kind of a calendar book is the best way to describe them. When we looked at early Christian art, and we looked at Gothic art, we saw manuscript illuminations typically in a very abstract mode. A sign of this northern realism is all of a sudden illuminations become realistic, believable image the images that are in this world a book of ours is a calendar book. There is usually one image for each month of the year. And this particular image is uh, October, which is a little strange to me, but I assume they're planting winter wheat because you notice they're planting. Uh, you have a sower and then you have a guy on a horse with some sort of a primitive plow who's digging up the uh, earth. You have the signs of the, the zodiac and the position of the sun in the upper part of the, uh, the image. 
And that building in the background is actually a very famous building, but you may not recognize it. It's actually the Louvre, the famous uh, museum in Paris. The Louvre was a castle before it became a museum. And what you can notice about that rendition of the building, it's a very realistic, very believable looking image. But at this point, the northern artists did not have a, a systematic understanding of linear perspective. It took an Italian to invent the system we call linear perspective. And uh, so this is simply very accurate physical ob observation of a very, very complex building. And so it can be rendered almost exactly in a linear perspective mode, but they don't have any system to do it that way. They simply do it by very meticulous observation. But anyway, caring about the calendar, caring about harvest and planting and so on, that obviously is a this world concern. That's the world we live in. That's the world that's capable of what we call the secular. The secular wasn't even possible in the medieval world. So now we all live the whole modern vision of life. Those of us who are people of faith have to live with, in a world that we call secular, and at the same time, find a way to have a living faith in the context of things that are not regarded as religious or especially sacred. Can we see the uh, next one, please? This is the Well of Moses by Klaus Luder. It's an amazing sculpture. Uh, it's actually in, it was a, a medieval pond that was the uh, source of water for a monastic community. And on the top of it was a crucifix that's no longer there. But I want you to see how capable these northern sculptors were. It's an amazing, complex, beautiful image that cares about the real world. Now, I'm going to reveal a little uh, personal prejudice here towards sculpture. Many of you know I am a sculptor. And sculpture, by its nature, is probably the most physical of all the art forms. When sculpture changes, and by the way, it changes more slowly than painting does, because it takes commission, it's expensive, it requires all kinds of uh, technical support. When sculpture changes, the world changes because it's a slow art form. Painting can change quickly, but sculpture is fundamental and it's physical. It's not an illusion like painting is. It's a real object. When you start to care about the real world, you start to think about sculpture. Those of us like myself who are people of faith have to then find a way, how do you mix your faith with, with the physicality of these objects you're making? One of the obvious ways of doing it is to represent angels and saints. And of course, that's what we see here. It's called the Well of Moses. You'll see this figure is holding some sort of a scroll, uh, the, the central figure with a long beard. That's a representation of uh, Moses, and the scroll he's holding represents the uh, commandments. There are other prof prophetic figures around the other sides of this, and you'll notice the beautifully carved angels above. 
a couple, in a couple weeks, we'll see Michelangelo's Moses. And of course, that's one of the most famous figures in the world. But in fact, Sluter's Moses is as well carved as Michelangelo's Moses. And it's done, well, oh, at least 100 years before Michelangelo's Moses. Now, can we see the next one? This, uh, Jan van Eyck is one of the most important, one of the most prominent uh, northern painters. He's uh, Flemish in background. Fl uh, Flanders it was part of modern day Belgium. It's, uh, Holland, uh, Belgium, the Low Countries. Flanders was located there. And in fact, through much of the period we're talking about, it was dominated by Spain. Spain had conquered the Low Countries. Anyway, Jan van Eyck was one of the most important painters of that period. And this is a polytic. A polytic is, it, polytic means many panels. The most common combination is a triptych, three panels. I'm going to finish this lecture off with a very famous and very weird looking triptych. Uh, but this is a polytic. Now they typically are more, much more common in Gothic churches than they would be in, um, in Italian churches, simply because of the nature of a Gothic architecture. You have the stained glass windows, and you have windows everywhere as a part of that Gothic style. Remember, it's a superstructure type of style. So very little stone, tons of glass, and there's no room for painting. So if you want sacred images other than those that are represented in the windows, you have to have these elaborate altar pieces, and they are typically occur right behind the main altar of the church. So it'd be the thing you'd see when you enter the church. They are many paneled and they're very, the carpentry is very complex. They can be folded up. And in fact, they usually have representations on the back and the front. And they can be flipped around certain times of the church year, certain images are seen. Other times of the church year, different images are seen. They can also be carried in processions. Anyway, this is a very complex one. And the, one, the part I want to point out is, are the two figures on the far left and the far right. Those two figures represent Adam and Eve. The figure in the center is God the Father. Mary, Queen of Heaven, is, is seated next to him. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, is on the other side. Then you have panels of angels singing and playing organs. But anyway, Adam and Eve are realistic human beings. Those are not classical bodies. They're mortal, like you and me. They don't have idealized bodies, like Michelangelo's David has. They're ordinary mortals, and again, perfect example of northern realism. This is the way real people look. Not some idealized athletic figure, but the way real people look. And by the way, the panel below, it's called Adoration of the Mystic Lamb. You notice the lamb on the altar, and of course the lamb is the symbol for Christ. And these figures are coming from four corners of the earth to, uh, to worship the Christ. One, two, three, four. Uh, you have various class classes represented, the aristocracy over here, more common figures over here. It's a comprehensive image, beautifully painted. Now, part of that beautiful painting 
is through a new technique called the oil painting. It's the Flemings that invented oil painting. In fact, Van Eyck is usually credited with the invention of it. It's basically taking pigment uh, and mixing it with oil, linseed oil, as a carrier. Typically, it's, it is done on wood panels in this early phase of the process. Uh, by the fact that oil dries slowly, it allows very slow, careful reworking of the forms. And because you can mix the paint thickly, and, and therefore it's very opaque, or thinly, or therefore it's very transparent, you can start, if you mix it thinly, that we call those glazes, you can start to layer those colors. And light shows through those layers. So the, the color starts to have a kind of luminous quality. You'll also have the possibility of deep, velvety shadows. And very, very gradual blending from one area to the other. Because oil dries very slowly. It actually takes about 10 months for oil painting to fully, fully dry. You have fat colors and lean colors. There's fat colors are usually the darker colors, like black or ultramarine blue. And they have a lot of oil in them. They dry very slowly. Leaner colors, uh, usually like yellow and some of the other lighter colors, dry more quickly. Any case, you get blending especially with that slow drying business. So you have the possibility of realism that you never had with tempera painting, which remember is a water-based painting uh, with using egg yolk as a binder that glues the paint to the surface. And so it dries very quickly. You can't, you can't blend it the way you can with oil. Can we see the next one, please? This is an amazing painting by Roger van der Weyden. The deposition becomes a very common theme in the Renaissance. It's, it's taking Christ's body down from the cross. And you'll notice one of the strange things about Northern realism is they will mix things that are highly realistic with things that don't make any logical sense at all. Look at that cross. There's no way the body of Christ could be crucified on that cross. That's, that's a typical northern approach. Again, they sort of mix this realism with medieval kind of sensibility of fantasy. The thing about von der Weyden is he has that same northern realism that we associate with Van Eyck, but he brings much more emotionality to it. Um, and he really deeply enriches the northern sensibility. Here you'll notice, let me just try to outline the painting. By the way, it's, it's uh, done in flat panels. Notice the background. It's meant to imitate one of these wooden altar pieces that is often uh, realistically carved. And we're going to finish off this lecture with examples of that. Um, anyway, if you look at the corners, the uh, Archer's Guild paid for this painting. So you'll notice these little brackets represent a bow and arrow in the, uh, in the corners. Then you have, of course, the most obvious image here is the dead body of Christ. And you'll notice Mary's pose. She's collapsed now. And notice how, how her body mimics his pose. So you get a sense of her deep empathy, deep compassion. John, the, the beloved disciple over here, he's often depicted with Mary. 
He's, of course, trying to support here. Uh, this is probably Mary Magdalene over here with one of the most uh, exaggerated expressions of grief in the painting. I think one of the most fascinating figures in the painting is this figure here. You notice his fancy robe. This probably represents Joseph of, of Arimathea who donated his uh, tomb for Christ's burial. And what I find most interesting about it is a very subtle expression of loss on his face. It's not tremendous anguish grief like we see with the Magdalene. It's this subtle, quiet, he's staring into space and somehow he's internalizing this, uh, this loss. Van der Weyden brings emotional energy to these scenes that Van Eyck never did. Van Eyck paintings have a kind of sober, physical, here's the way the world looks quality, but they don't tell us much about what those figures are feeling. Can we see the next one, please? The idea of the Last Supper is, in fact, a very common painting subject during the period we're talking about. In most Renaissance monasteries, they have a room called the refectory. That's the place where the monks eat. And so Last Supper becomes a relevant theme to have an inner refectory. This is one by Dirk Bouts. And uh, again, it shows us northern realism. And it, in fact, has a, a strange kind of not totally coordinated attempt at, at linear uh, realism. Uh, these diagonal lines that are part of uh, a linear perspective, notice how they converge over Christ's head here. Um, actually, you see a landscape outside here, you just get a hint of it. But the eye level of landscape is probably about there, and the lines converge, but not at exactly that level as they should. Again, it's an example of northern realism. You see the tiles on the floor, again, have that converging quality. Notice the painting has a kind of overall somber uh, quality to it. Very much unlike uh, Leonardo's Last Supper that we'll be seeing in a couple weeks. But again, I wanted you to see this northern, ex northern example of realism. And again, not only do you have the sacred figures, Christ and the apostles, you get servants. You've got a couple servants uh, looking at the scene from the back. You have a servant over here. Um, again, it's oil on uh, wood panel. So you just see the range of tones and the deep vel velvety darks you can get with that particular uh, paint medium. Notice the architecture that's represented is Gothic architecture. Can we see the next one, please? Now, something happened, apparently. There we go. OK. During this time, there is a interaction that's starting up between Italian and Northern art. This particular uh, panel, it's a large uh, painting. I think it's about 7 feet high, and I think it's about 12 feet feet across. It's a triptych. It's actually in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, Italy. But it's, it's done by a northern Flemish painter. And it was one of the first examples of Flemish art coming into Italy. And so the Italians were blown away by this thing. The level of realism 
that you could get with oil paint and that whole northern way of representing things. But again, the northern approach is a strange mixture of medieval sanctity and physical real world, this is the way it looks, realism. So notice here, we have a range of scale. The angels are at a different scale uh, than some of the main figures of the, uh, of the panel. And another really important element in this particular painting that the Italians would never really represent are the shepherds over here. They represent the lower classes. They're not dressed as elegantly as other figures in the panel, but they're, they're worshiping the Christ. The Christ is the infant on the ground here. Uh, in fact, if you look in the background, you have a, a whole series of painting, paintings that are going on as secondary. Here you have the flight into Egypt represented back here. Uh, I think you're getting Moses with the Ten Commandments here. Uh, these Flemish paintings are filled with all kinds of symbols that only if you're, uh, if you're acquainted with the symbolism, you can't see this very clearly, but in fact, at the entranceway of this building in the background is a, uh, a carving of a harp. You might wonder, well, what's that got to do? Remember King David was a musician. He's, he played the harp, he sang for King Saul, and this represents the Davidic origins of the Christ. Anyway, you notice how they can combine the scale. Again, you've got mature figures over here. This is probably John the Baptist there. And then all of again, again, these smaller figures, they're sort of, I guess they're children. They don't have wings like the angels do. At least I can't see them very clearly here. But again, everything is done in this hard-edged, very meticulous, careful uh, style. And so the Italians were really impressed with the uh, realism of this work. Can we see the next one, please? This is uh, the Maraud altarpiece by Robert Campan. Uh, and it's, again, a, a strange, realistic painting that's real and not quite real. Uh, if you, let me catalog the painting. First of all, you have the donors on the far left. And they're able to look in. A, you notice the door is open. They're able to look through that door and look at this holy scene. The scene itself in the center is the Annunciation. Gabriel announcing to Mary that she will be pregnant with the Christ child. And you may not notice this very easily, I'll point it out. Coming through the light in the window is a little cross shape with wings that represents the spirit entering into, uh, into Mary. She's supposedly uh, seated reading the scriptures, but there's a kind of odd relationship between this bench that's in front of the fireplace and her posture. It's hard to imagine how she's seated on that, that bench. Following that right to left or left to right cataloging, you have over here Joseph, Remember, Joseph's a carpenter. For many years, people were wondering, what is he doing over there? What is he, he working on? In fact, there's a little object on the table here. Again, we don't have a close-up of it. But one art historian finally figured out what he was working on. He's working on a medieval mousetrap. 
And the whole idea is on the cross, Christ trapped Satan. And so Joseph becomes the originator of this idea of, it appears as if it's all lost, but in fact it's all one because Satan, has, his power is broken on the cross. You'll notice the perspective sometimes makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. This table uh, in front of the angel, in fact, is not rendered in perspective. They seem to understand how, how the straight lines of buildings can be perspective, but they don't quite understand how a circle can become an ellipse when it's seen at, a, uh, at an angle. So you get strange mixture of perspectives. Also, given the depth of the room, for some reason or other, that bench that she's leaning against looks to me like it goes on forever. It just looks like it's too long to fit in that room. But the idea is the painting is full of all kinds of secret symbols. You have the lily on the table, a symbol of her purity. Again, this polished pot in the background sort of represents uh, her, uh, the idea of her pregnancy. She's going to be a container for the Christ child and notice it's, it's polished and clean and pure. So the, the Flemish artists, again, when they're trying to mix this concern about the real world, and the, uh, the world of the spirit come up with these strange ways of using physical things that carry some sort of symbolic meaning. Unless you're acquainted with the Flemish symbolic vocabulary, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see the things I'm talking about. And let's look at the next work, which is really uh, full of a lot of these symbols. This is an, another painting by Van Eyck. Uh, it's sometimes called a wedding certificate. There's some questioning about that in the art world. Arnold Feeney was actually a, uh, a Medici agent. Remember, the Medici were bankers and their empire went throughout Europe. All of their wealth came from all of these locations in Europe. Arnolfini was, and of course that's an Italian name, and he was one of their agents in uh, Flanders. And here we have a, a portrait of him and his wife, or wife-to-be. This supposedly is some sort of wedding certificate. Again, it's done in this northern realism. And remember, it's by Van Eyck. So notice how somber the faces are. They're, it's full of these static, quiet symbols, but doesn't show a lot of emotion. Let's catalog what's here again symbolically. Start what you wonder. What's a dog doing there? Fido is a common word we use for a dog that comes from Latin fidelity, faithfulness. So the dog represents the faithfulness of the wedding vow. There in stocking feet, you can see that with him, and here's his the clogs on the floor. The idea uh, of holy ground, Moses took off his sandals because he was on holy ground. The candelabra only has one candle in it, one lit candle. That represents the eye of God. God is there witnessing this scene. You notice a beautiful rendition of uh, sunlight on the bench next, or the table next to the window, you have some oranges. They, of course, represent fruitfulness of the, uh, the marriage. 
up here on the top of the uh, bedpost, you have a wood carving of the statue of Saint Margaret, who is the uh, saint of uh, childbirth. Beneath her is a, uh, a little broom representing the so whole Dutch idea of cleanliness, the cleanliness of the household. And in the background, you have probably a second image of the eye of God in this in mirror. The mirror has a series of very, very small paintings, I think 10 of them as you go around there, representing the life of Christ. And in fact, it's a convex mirror, so it shows the back of the couple, and in fact, if you see a close-up of it, you can actually see it reflects the artist himself looking at them. It's just an extraordinary level of realism and detail. Here, here you get a sense of that. Here's the artist, here's the back of the Arnolfini couple. Again, it appears to be done in a kind of perspectival uh, realism, but uh, not exactly a linear perspective. Again, if you weren't familiar with this symbolism, you, you wouldn't get the whole spiritual significance of this. You see how wedded these things are in, at this time? We think of the religious as got to separate it somehow, somehow, some way from the secular for it to be truly religious. They didn't think that way. These things are interfused together. Can we see the next one, please? We think this might be a uh, self-portrait by Van Eyck. Uh, it's always been called Portrait of a Man in a Red Turban. Um, there is some question about the whole Van Eyck situation because he had a brother named uh, Herbert and uh, people can't, and most of the paintings are attributed to Jan and people wonder what was Herbert and some think that he was a uh, carpenter, sculptor and he made the whole uh, cabinet for the, uh, the altars that uh, Van Eyck made and this could be a self-portrait by Van Eyck or it could be a portrait of his brother Jan but the very fact that it's a portrait tells us something. The individual starts to be important. Portraits are not a part of the medieval way of thinking. The individual is only a type, only represents some action, or some sacred event. Just the fact of the individual and the way they look becomes important all of a sudden. This is the age that of the, what we call genius artists. This is the age when artists are thought to be distinctive individuals who have the quality of genius. For instance, Michelangelo, during his lifetime, was called Michelangelo the Divine. In other words, his gifts were so extreme that there, there was a divine quality in him and his gifts. It was a kind of odd uh, combination because Michelangelo was anything but an ideal uh, body type. He was barely uh, five feet tall, barely weighed 100 pounds, had a broken nose, um, and uh, he, when you look at the David, you, you, you have to think that that's Michelangelo wishful thinking because he wasn't anything like that physically. But anyway, the artist becomes this, he has this ability to create these images 
to sort of recreate life. You and I probably don't uh, get impressed by this because we're surrounded with images. You all carry phones that are full of images. In this world, the idea of a realistic image is really like creating life from nothing. It really matters. And an artist becomes a really important part of the social order because the artist can do this sort of thing. Now, can we see the next one, please? This work is by van der Weyden, again a portrait. But you'll notice he takes the same Flemish realism and he mixes certain feelings with it. Notice she doesn't look at us. Notice she's looking down. Also notice how complex her fingers, fingers are represented and how tight that gesture is, as if she's trying to contain herself in some way. You get the impression of an individual who's very shy. Again, van der Weyden starts to care about not just the appearance, but the way the appearance can express what's inside the person, their feelings, their, their character. He works, and his whole palette here is a relatively, what we call a cool palette. Uh, the white, notice the blue background. Uh, only, the only real color in the painting is this red sh uh, uh, sash around her very narrow waist. And it indicates a, 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 just a quiet, reserved, person. Uh, it's, so it's not just the way she looked, it's who she was. Again, look at the way he, he doesn't give us endless details like um, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Van Eyck's do. He gives us a simple platter, uh, pattern that are, is represented by this veil headpiece that she's, uh, she's wearing. Can we have the next one, please? This is one of this, the weirdest paintings ever made. So I'm not going to, I can highlight some of the things that are in it but I'm certainly not going to be able to explain it. <laughs> and, uh, no one can quite explain it. It's typically called the Garden of Earthly Delights. It's in a triptych format. It's a big painting. I think it's seven, eight feet across. But look carefully at this thing. Can you imagine this thing on the altar of a church? Um, it's, again, it's a sort of a northern way of thinking in the sense of the realism of the painting, but it's somehow a throwback to medieval mysticism in some sort of way. One of the things to be said about the the painting, before we get into the specific symbolic imagery in the painting, is notice the figures are small. It's full of figures. I don't know how many figures in, 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 represent in the painting, but might be probably 50, 60 figures at least. They're all small almost insect-like in their scale. This is not a heroic rendition of the human condition. 
The figures are small and, and therefore fragile physically, but maybe fragile morally as well. Let's uh, f uh, work through the painting and try to highlight some of the imagery here. As you start at the left, you have these figures of probably Adam and Eve, and uh, this figure probably represents God the Father. Here you have a fanciful kind of fountain, uh, represents maybe the fountain of life, and then animals drinking, and strange animals in the background, odd uh, landscape shapes. But even in this paradisical movement moment, you have a cat with a mouse in its jaws. So somehow death enters into this supposedly idealistic scene. All kinds of other animals represented as a part of this supposedly idyllic scene. Now the part of the painting that interests everyone are these, this grouping of figures in the center. Usually they're couples. So there's some sexual reference going on here, but no one can quite figure out quite what it is. And there are a lot of birds represented in, uh, in the scene. Birds, because of their flightiness, become a kind of symbol of moral uh, sort of flightiness and impermanence. And then all kinds of weird, odd symbols. Here you have a couple in some sort of a crystal glass-like dome. Then you've got another figure next to them upside down with its legs spread in, uh, in this pond. Again, a dark owl sort of brooding, overlooking that scene. And all kinds of dancing and who knows what going on here. Although there's no real explicit uh, coupling in the whole painting. Uh, and then finally, you get over here, and this becomes a last judgment scene. Uh, highlighting some of the symbols there. This symbol here, uh, it's a figure whose hands are nailed to a table. The idea is he represents the sin of gambling. So he's crucified on the gaming table. Bosch had this thing about music. He thought it was an instrument of the devil. Here you see a harp, and on that harp, again, is a figure crucified with the strings going through its body. Again, music becomes some sort of a uh, uh, means of human downfall. Odd, weird shapes, this egg-like form becoming the rear end of a figure, and here's its head over here. Again, probably another negative refer reference to music because the ears, the instruments of hearing, have been cut in half by a knife. Odd sort of devastation of architecture up here. And the whole scene, of course, has a dark, bombed out look about it. Now that's the kind of catalog of what's to be seen there. What does that mean? Uh, all I can get is there's not a very warm or positive understanding of the human condition. That's as close as I can, uh, as I can get to it. But uh, I'm sure there might be much more to be, be said about it than that.
Can we see the next one, please? <coughs> one of the things that happens in mid uh, late medieval Europe in the 1400s is you get the development of guilds. Guilds are groups of people uh, who develop a highly specialized skill. They're like modern day unions. They become very powerful forces in medieval towns. And they develop a system of training that is very, very rigorous. And so extraordinary skills get developed during this period because the training is so slow and rigorous. Now I'm a result of modern university training, training which is typically the way artists get trained today. And we have nowhere near this level of skill because we haven't been trained as carefully and slowly as these people were. I know a little bit about guilds, partly because of my living experience. My father was a dental technician. Dental technicians are one of the few craftspeople left in the real world because they have to make things that fit perfectly, absolutely perfectly, in the complexities of the human mouth. And so I worked with my father. I worked with his fellow technicians. He, he owned his own uh, dental lab. And so I worked there throughout my, uh, my teen years in the summer when I wasn't involved with athletics during the, the school year. And uh, I know a little bit about these trades and how meticulous and careful the work is. You can see the level of carving in Remen Schneider's work here. This is about as good as wood carving gets. The image is the Assumption of the Virgin. There, there's Mary in the center. She, again, you get this northern mixture of scale. So you've got this large figure of Mary, but she's surrounded with these angels who are done at a different scale. And then you get this really elaborate scroll-like carving. Again, it's sort of a carryover over uh, of the manuscript, il manuscript illuminations that uh, were part of the medieval period with the elaborate ornate kind of uh, lettering and so on. Here's an image of the whole, the whole composition. Again, you see it's, it's a uh, triptych, so its panels can be, uh, can be folded. You see why am I talking about realism when I'm, when I'm talking about the North. The Italians never developed carving this accurately or this complex because they weren't inter interested in doing this. That just wasn't a part of their way of thinking. They were shaped more by a classic understanding of uh, the human body and, uh, and uh, the whole idea of a spirituality. Well, I want to leave a minute or two. I think that's the last one, isn't it, Janet? Yeah. As I say, this is a complex subject. We're pretty close to uh, the last minute, but we've got to have a couple of minutes left. Can I help you with any questions you might have? Don't ask me to explain the Garden of Delights. <laughs> Anyone, can I help you? The invention of the printing press was about somewhere in this century? I'm sorry, what? The printing press and the Guggenheim yeah. Bible. Uh -huh. How is that kind of Guggenheim Bible? 
Uh, Gutenberg, yeah. Gutenberg. Yeah. There's a G in there. It's uh, mid-1400s. Uh, 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 and it, of course, will totally shape, reshape the world practically. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, a little later than much of, of what I'm showing. But, but it's part of that medieval world, and it's going to change everything in the world, really. Anything else I can help you with? What, what are the dates for Rembrandt? For Rembrandt, what are his dates in comparison? Rembrandt? Yeah. Rembrandt is uh, well into the 1600s. Okay. He's Baroque. He's one of the reasons that originally I was going to do Renaissance Baroque. But I look at Rembrandt and I said, I can't do Rembrandt in 10 minutes or five minutes. I've got to give Rembrandt lots and lots of time. And Rembrandt, again, giving his background in the Low Countries, he probably is the most sophisticated mixture of faith and realism that the art world has, has ever uh, produced. But yeah, he's, he's a later. We'll get to him in the fall. Anyone else? Yes? Do any of the artists ever tell anybody what they're trying to represent themselves? The artists tell, hey, I did this, and this is what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, I mean, are they representing themselves? They're actually starting to sign work, if that's what you mean. So they're, they're starting to sign work. So their, their name starts to become important as, a, as an individual. We think of signatures on a work of art as just sort of what an artist does. But our medieval artists didn't sign the work. Very rarely did medieval artists do that. Um, yes? Did any of these artists I was like, live at the same time or know each other? Van der Weyden and Van Eyck's, I think, interacted uh, quite a bit. Uh, honestly, couldn't answer that question. I, I'm not really sure how much interaction we get. I can, again, I know much more about the Italians because I live there. So I can tell you about how the Italians interacted with each other. These artists, I'm not really, really that sure about. What I, I know what they were part of was, as I say, this guild system. So they, they interacted with each other in, the, in this guild process of technical development. Yes? This lady's question back here made me think. Did, did artists ever actually tell you what they were do, saying in a picture? Do we have any record of an artist saying, this is why I painted this because I, this relates to this? Or? Mm -hmm. Generally not. Okay. Most of us, even in the, in the modern world where we're highly educated and literate, generally prefer to communicate through visual symbols. And the reason we do that is we don't want to totally control your interaction with the work. If I tell you what to think, then it's all me controlling it. You're not bringing your history, your interpretation, your personality to the process. So artists like freedom, and not just freedom from the, for themselves, but freedoms for other people. So the closest thing you're going to get to an artist telling you typically what to think about is a title. I use titles, I, I come from a fairly literary perspective. I'm much more literary in my sensibility than most visual artists. And so titles are really important to me. I'm gonna be showing my own work on campus here in another month or so. And you should pay attention to the titles. The titles are a cue, but they are only a cue. They are not an explanation. I try to come up with titles that are open-ended 
in, they just give you a general direction in which to look. Generally, artists don't talk about their work. They prefer not to. That's not who they are. That's not what they do. They've done it. It's there. That's right. It's for us to interpret it. Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, lunchtime, folks. <laughs> Thank you again all for coming. Hope to see you next time. We'll see the Italians next time. <laughs>